One of the reasons I'm so passionate about our approach to growing food is that it works very well when times are good and when times are uncertain. If we experience a loss of income, had less time to devote to the garden, lost some of our physical capabilities, or had limited access to gardening resources like seeds and fertilizer, we'd still be able to grow a lot of our own food. Today I'll share my 12 keys to growing a lot of food when times are good and when times are uncertain. The first key is to grow in the soil. Soil is more readily available than other growing mediums. And growing in the soil costs less and requires access to fewer external resources. As long as we have this little bit of land, access to a community garden, or even an area where we can grow in containers, we can grow in the soil with minimal cost and effort. The second key to growing food in uncertain times is to use a no-dig approach and to always keep the soil covered with free organic matter. No-dig has many advantages over tilling, which disrupts soil structure, increases compaction, disrupts mycorrhizal networks, and kills beneficial soil organisms like earthworms. It also brings weed seeds to the surface where they can germinate. And during hard times, with the no-dig approach, I don't have to buy, rent, or maintain a tiller or buy gasoline to fuel it. Instead, I disturb the soil as little as possible, cover it with free organic matter, and let earthworms break up and aerate the soil. Organic mulches reduce erosion, conserve water, feed the soil food web, moderate soil temperatures, and gradually release nutrients needed by plants. This approach works equally well in good times and bad. As long as I can collect free local resources like autumn leaves, grass clippings, chop and drop garden waste, ground eggshells, comfrey, and wood chips, I can keep the soil covered with organic matter. And in many years, when I'm not as strong as I am now, I still hope to be able to continue using this approach. The third key is to make your own compost using only free local resources. Compost promotes a healthy soil food web and may provide all the nutrients your plants need so that you don't have to buy any fertilizers. I make compost with the same free resources we use for mulch. Though traditional hot composting is labor intensive and requires regular turning, my approach is to simply build the pile, keep it moist, and harvest the compost when it's ready. Because I don't turn the pile, I have to wait longer for finished compost, but this low effort approach would work very well even if I had less time to devote to the garden or my back problems flared up. Not only that, the free compost has helped make store-bought fertilizers completely unnecessary as there's more than enough nutrients in our soil without them. The fourth key to growing food in uncertain times is to grow lots of edible perennials. You only have to plant them once and they produce harvest year after year with minimal cost and effort. We're currently growing 27 different perennial fruits, vegetables, and herbs that take up nearly half of our growing space. And every year we plant more. This year we'll plant red raspberries and gooseberries. As we grow more and more edible perennials and fewer annuals, our garden will continue to produce abundant harvests, but the cost and effort required to maintain the garden will go down. This is exactly the scenario you want to have in place to be prepared for uncertain times. Like perennials, self-sowing annuals grow a lot of food year after year with minimal cost and effort after just one planting. Our fifth key to growing food in uncertain times is to grow self-sowing annuals. The best self-sowing plants vary depending on where you live. In our climate, we found that the best self-sowers are cool weather greens like mustard greens, tadsoy, arugula, pak choy, mosh, and cletonia. In fact, other than perennials, most of the plants in our winter garden beds are self-sown. We just let many of the plants go to seed in the summer and drop their seeds in place to produce the next crop. This allows us to grow these crops year after year without buying more seeds or even having to manually plant them. The sixth key is to grow in polycultures instead of monocultures. Polycultures reduce pest and disease pressures and allow you to grow healthier crops with less reliance on synthetic or organic pesticides. When you interplant a broad diversity of unrelated crops in the same area, garden pests have more difficulty finding their desired plants and diseases are less likely to take hold. Using this approach, we found that predators keep most pests in check. Damage to our crops is minimal, and no pesticides are needed. By letting nature do most of the work for us, we have less work to do, and we save money by not buying pesticides. The seventh key to growing food in uncertain times is to conserve water. With weather becoming more unpredictable and droughts more common, it's important to conserve water. Though we typically get a good amount of rain here in the Chicago area, 
we still take a few measures to conserve water. First, we mulch our garden beds, which reduces evaporation and increases the water holding capacity of the soil. Second, we harvest rain from the roof in a rain barrel. And third, when we wash our produce, we save the water to use in the garden. If we lived in a drier climate, we might also use wicking beds, save gray water from our laundry, and store water in the landscape with swales. The eighth key is to save and share seeds. Knowing how to save seeds is one of the most important skills for a self-sufficient gardener, especially in uncertain times. And swapping seeds with others is a great way to ensure you and your gardening friends all have the seeds you need. If you're new to seed saving and want to learn more, I highly recommend the book Seed to Seed by Susanna Ashworth. I've provided a link to the book in the description below. The ninth key to growing a lot of food in uncertain times is to extend the growing season. This can be as simple as starting cool weather crops earlier in the spring and growing them later into the fall. Or you can extend the growing season further by growing under cover during the cold months. Many people think of the growing season as starting with the last frost in the spring and ending with the first frost in the fall. But many cool weather crops can be planted weeks before the last frost and many can grow well past the first frost. So it's possible to extend the growing season, significantly increase yields, and become more self-sufficient simply by growing more cool weather crops in the spring and fall. And if you'd like to extend the growing season further, you can grow under cover. Here in Zone 5, we grow many crops through the winter under double cover without supplemental heat. If you'd like to learn more about how we do it, please see this link. The tenth key is to use salvage materials to build cold frames, compost bins, raised beds, and more. Over the years, we've made compost bins from tree branches, raised bed borders from trees, and cold frames from discarded windows and repurposed wood. Using salvage materials for garden projects is a great way to stretch a dollar when money is tight. The eleventh key is to preserve and store surplus harvest for the winter. As vegetarians, my wife and I eat a lot of fruit and veg, and we manage to eat most of our harvest in real time. But we do dehydrate some tomatoes and peppers, freeze kale and collards, and store onions, garlic, sweet potatoes, winter squash, and dried beans for winter meals. The twelfth and last key is don't do things that you don't need to do. There are so many recommended gardening products and practices out there. If you tried to follow all of them, you wouldn't have time for anything else, and growing your own food would be very expensive. This is the last thing you need in uncertain times. Fortunately, many of these recommendations can simply be ignored with little to no downside. I've made a number of videos that go into more detail, but some of the practices you can probably avoid include tilling, double digging, making compost tea, turning compost, fertilizing with Epsom salts, and using mycorrhizal amendments. And my position on fertilizers is to use them only if a soil test shows they're needed. Our soil test confirmed they are not needed in our garden. Before closing, I thought I'd talk about a few changes we could make to our approach to make it even more effective during uncertain times. The most significant change would be to raise a few hens to produce eggs. This would give us more of our protein needs from the garden and we could use the chicken manure to improve soil fertility. I'd also consider not building new raised beds when the current beds are no longer structurally sound. Though I like raised beds, they aren't a necessity in our garden. Finally, if physical limitations made it difficult for me to make compost, I'd probably stop making it and focus on mulching alone, which should be sufficient to maintain soil fertility going forward. Though I might make these relatively small changes, it's great to be using an approach that works very well in good times and when times are uncertain. If I were dependent on a labor-intensive approach that required large investments in fertilizers and amendments, an injury or loss of income would require me to make dramatic changes. But with my current approach, I could continue to grow with minimal interruption. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, please subscribe for more videos on how to grow a lot of food on a little land without spending much or working harder than you have to.